Good morning, everyone. Um, so talking first today will be Ross. Um, he's going to be talking to us about Docker for Hackers. So please give him a hand. Morning, everyone. Um, as Jesper said, my name is Ross. I'm going to be talking about Docker for Hackers. Um, I'm a web services developer by day, so that's a lot of back-end stuff, joining systems, a bit of optimization, and I do some hackery security audit stuff by night. So Docker's quite a nice fix between those two realms. I've spoken at ZedeCon previously, which is the Gerber conference. It's now um, OXCon, or Zero XCon, I think, is the sort of spin-off from that that started up this year. And I've had the privilege of being at B-Sides previously, and I've got two Twitter accounts just to make life difficult and a blog where I rant about stuff that's probably not worth reading. Um, so today's talk is going to be more sort of introductory. We're not dropping any Docker O days, but um, I became aware that a lot of people in security and even devs don't know very much about Docker. And to me, it's one of the most useful tools of recent times. So I kind of just want to make a case for why it's worth using, show you uh, different use cases, a little bit of how to use it. I'm going to skip over some steps, so this does not replace like a getting started guide, by all means, if you're interested, go and read a proper Docker getting started guide. But I've just tried to highlight a few interesting points, hopefully for inspiration or for warning. So ultimately, Docker is a tool for running containers, um, which doesn't explain a whole lot. But a container is typically a single application or service and its dependencies. So it's this nice little bundled, ready to run thing. It's not an operating system. It's not a virtual machine. It's literally an application and its dependencies. And it's in a standardized format. So the idea of containers is not something new. Docker didn't necessarily invent anything, but they did a lot to standardize it. So it's a bit like the Raspberry Pi. It is sort of the de facto container running solution at the moment, although there are many others. Um, and a lot of times when people are talking about containers, what they actually mean is images. Images are a little bit like an ISO file. So that is the collection of all the layers and the parts and the information about what is to be run. And a container is an instance of that. So one image might be run 10 times. So you have 10 running containers, but only one actual source image that it's come from. Um, and yeah, Docker is really popular with DevOps and microservices because it allows you to very easily manage um, sort of the deployment of these things, scaling of them. If you've got microservices that need to talk to each other, rather than running a whole lot of virtual machines, you can run much smaller Docker images. So I've mentioned virtual machines a few times. Um, Docker has similarities to virtual machines in that it uses images that you can pass around. You can build it once and deploy it all over the place. People can share it on a network. It's great if you're a dev. You can keep like a snapshot of your environment and then sort of spin it up as you need to um, run different versions, maybe tweak something for staging or something like that. It also uses the host's hardware resources. So there's a client and server aspect. The server aspect will be the host that's running the virtual machines. Obviously, you can't use more RAM or disk space than the host has. And you need to sort of accommodate for the number of containers that you're running on that host, sort of divide out the resources. You can also mount in shares. So that's a really useful feature. You can have like a shared directory that a lot of containers run. Um, same with virtual machines. And also virtual networking. So there's bridging options. There are host networking options. So there's a little bit of security that brings you in terms of isolation, a lot of flexibility. So a lot that's in common with virtual machines. There's also a lot that's not in common with virtual machines. So if you build a virtual machine um, using Vagrant, you probably use something like Debian or Ubuntu as your base image. And you're probably going to end up with a couple of gigs worth of uh, images. And if you've got a dev uh, VM and a staging VM and a prod VM and sort of a branch version, you're probably looking at like five different VMs at five gigs each for 25 gigs, whereas uh, Docker uses much, much, much smaller images. Because it's just your code, any files you've attached and dependencies, you're probably working in megs or tens or hundreds of megs rather than in gigs. And they also share layers. So when you pull down Ubuntu once and everything branches off of Ubuntu, you've got that sort of two gig layer once and then 100 meg layer, 100 meg layer, and 100 meg layer for your different environments. So it uses a lot less space. It's a lot easier when you have like a CI server and you're I don't know, working over VPN. You don't have to pull down 25 gigs to get your environment up. Another nice feature is the command line interaction. Unlike Vagrant, you don't have to SSH into a Docker container to do things or connect with your remote desktop. You can actually pipe stuff in and out of it. You can run it in your command line, pipe the output, and then use your native operating systems, tools um, to do other things. So it, it feels a lot more native. The tools that you're running are a lot more accessible and reusable. One thing that I see as a bit of a downside is that the CPU is not emulated. 
when Docker containers are running, you can actually, in your host Linux operating system, for example, type ps or top, and you will see those Docker, they've got the separate PIDs, and it's Docker running processes. So it's very much in the same space as your host. So if something does go horribly wrong, your host is potentially compromised. There's obviously a lot of steps towards isolation, so that shouldn't be a concern. But do just realize that these are actually processes running on your host um, with some sort of safeguards in place. It's not sort of one big ball that's emulated that is running inside. And Docker runs pretty much everywhere these days, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, the cloud, even Raspberry Pis, which I found quite interesting. Again, there are client and server aspects, so sort of mileage varies depending on what you're doing, but ultimately the Docker client, at the very least, should run almost anywhere, allow you to connect to a Docker host, start, stop, view, there's things like that. Um, there are official images. These are trusted, and you can download them from store.docker.com. So Docker is also the organization. They vet a lot of these images, pretty much put their stamp of approval on them. So, for example, if you pull down the Ubuntu image, they've checked it out. They make sure that it's fairly stable, reliable, things like that. So when you use just Ubuntu without any kind of namespace or prefixing or username, that's coming from the Docker store, trusted by Docker. There are also community images. So any one of us can push our own image up to docker.com. Um, they've got hub.docker.com. Store will let you look at hub images. But basically, the idea with the store, like an app store, is those are sort of certified pre-built images, whereas hub is much of a free-for-all. And um, it's prefixed with the username of the person who pushed that up. So I could fork the official Ubuntu one, but I can never replace it. I can only end up with my own version of it. So it's a lot like Git with, with forking. Um, you can also use a private repository, again, like Git, um, for your network, for your VPN, things like that. You can push images to your own image sort of storage and pull them from there. You don't have to use the official docker.com sites, but it is obviously the easiest way to get up and running. And then when you pull down an image, when you reference it, it's downloaded to your machine. So any other time you reference, for example, the Fushu Ubuntu or the namespace one, it'll keep using them off your machine. Um, when you create them, initially they're saved to your machine. You have to intentionally um, push them up to Docker Hub if you want them to be publicly available. So, um, as I say, it's pulled down locally. Most of what you're building is local, and pushing up is quite trusted. And you can also use the names that are in use on store.docker.com. So we could push an image called Ubuntu locally or to our own repository. There's no sort of global restriction on names, just with their um, store.docker.com. In the same way that if I run a private GitHub, uh, private Docker repository, I should be able to name my container anything, even if you've called your container the same name to your repository. There's no communication, there's no global network or anything like that. But it does mean that you can't always trust the name that you see, unless you also check where it's pulling from. If it's not coming from store.docker.com, there's no guarantee that Ubuntu is the official Docker authorized um, container, so just be aware of your image. So that's quite a bit of theory, um, so let's take a look at what it actually is. So there's a very popular BSD tool game called Fortune, which prints out saying onto your screen. I happen to be using a Mac, and if I try and run Fortune on Mac, it's not there. If I do. Yes, I probably could just brew install it, but we can also do it with Docker, so let's take a look at that. I mentioned the Docker store, so here I've done a search um, you'll see in the address bar the source is the community, so it's actually pulling from the hub's collection of images, but this is the store's UI. There's one in the middle there with 307 pulls, fortune command, so that looks like one that we can give a try. This is the hub page, so it's showing the same information, slightly different UI, and again, you can see the same image, so we're going to give that one a run. So what we do is we copy the full path, so that's the username forward slash fortune, and we type in docker run, and we specify that name. The text in gray is what Docker does, so it says it can't find that image locally. It's now going to try and pull it down from the store. I mentioned there's lots of layers, so here you can see there's two layers that it's pulled down. Those layers would be reusable if this author has made some other containers. There might be some reuse to speed up downloads and caching and things like that. Ultimately, you end up with a hash for that image that's been downloaded. It tells you that it's downloaded, and it then runs the container, which puts out a bit of a grim message. But that is the result of Fortune. And as I mentioned previously, this is running in a terminal. So I haven't had to SSH into anything. I can just select and copy and paste that. I could pipe this out. So I really like that command line interactability with it. This is not an official output. I've just put this on my slide so you can get an idea as we're using different containers what size we're in for. So if this was a fresh Mac install with just Docker, I wouldn't have to install command line tools, homebrew, things like that, if I just want a 4-meg app. 
So assuming Docker is installed, I just had to download four megs and it's taking up four megs of disk space. So very, very minimal. Again, compare that to Vagrant uh, with an Ubuntu image. I mean, you'd be in for three gigs just to install a four meg app. Not very ideal. So let's take a bit of a more practical look at using Docker for something interesting. We're going to run Apache web server. And by default, Docker is going to use bridge networking. So you're able to get internet access incoming, or at least network access incoming, but you have to intentionally tell it to do that. So to run Apache web server, first thing I'm going to do is make an HTML directory. I'm just going to output some text into that directory as index.html. So this is my local machine, no magic happening just yet. What we want to do now is serve that on the internet or network. You can tell Docker to run in uh, daemon mode. That's the minus D after the Docker run command. We can tell it to share port 8080 of the host machine connecting to port 80 of the container that's going to be running. So that's our port mapping. We're basically opening up a port, allowing it to come into the Docker container. The minus V lets you mount in a volume. So again, this is the HTML directories on the host machine, but we need Apache that's running in the container to have access to it. So we mount the volume in using our current directory port slash HTML. Separated by a colon, we're telling it where it is in the file system of the container, which is user local Apache 2 HD docs. So now that we've configured everything, we're able to run the image. HTTPD, that's actually Apache. There's no username before it. This is coming from Docker, and this is going to be their trusted image. Again, it can't find the image locally. It starts pulling it. You see there's multiple layers. You can see the very first layer there already exists. So that didn't need to be downloaded. Again, it's reusing these layers. So the more you use Docker, the less and less and less you're going to end up actually downloading every time. There were some layers that it needed to download. It downloads in parallel, which is quite nice. You see progress, and you can see how much you're downloading. Again, you get a hash at the end. So that's the image. This is actually not the container. This is actually also an image. Image name, that's the image ID, so I've labeled that incorrectly. But um, it's now started. So we actually return to our command prompt. Unlike last time, it didn't do any output because we ran in daemon mode. We get our command prompt back. It's running in the background. And if we open our web browser, we go to the host's local host port 8080. So again, no VNC, desktop sharing, fighting with browsers. You're using your native tools that you're already used to. It connects local host port 8080. It's piped in, and Apache is now serving that index HTML file that's actually on our host machine. Again, a host machine, so we're able to change that text. So we're going to strike out hello world and change it to hello hackers. We're just piping it to that file on our folder or in our directory. And if we refresh our browser, it's immediately refreshed. So there's no syncing that happens. It's not like Docker imports or has to poll or anything like that. It's literally like a symlink. It's mapped to the host machine's directory. Anything that happens there happens for Apache inside Docker right away. I mentioned it's running in background. But if you run Docker PS, it's like a process list. Here you can see all the Docker containers that are running. On the far left is the container ID. It's different from the image ID. If we'd spun up multiple copies of this image, each would have their own container ID. So this is a way that we can uh, reference a specific running instance. It tells us what the image is, which is HTTPD. It tells us the command we won't worry about for now. And we can see the ports that are mapped. So, we can ask for the logs from that running container if we want to do some kind of debugging, make sure it started up correctly. We can see Apache logs that are happening there. That's what it's outputting to its virtual terminal inside Docker. We can also get a bash session into that container. So this is kind of like Vagrant SSH. There's no SSH service running, but basically what we're saying is we want to attach to this container, not necessarily view what it's doing in the primary terminal, but it's like we want a secondary terminal. So we're able to run bash inside of that running container, and we're saying there that we want an interactive pseudo terminal. So it's almost like now a second thread that's happening, or second process inside the container. You can now see the user is root at the same hash of the container, and you can see the path that we're in. So we can do a listing of the HT docs, and we see our index HTML file. So the Docker container thinks this is a local directory. It's actually on our host machine, and everything just works, which is awesome. So getting a little more into the realm of hacking, very popular tool, Nikto. We may want to run that. Um, the interesting thing here is the dash dash RM. It's almost like incognito mode for containers. When a container runs, even if the process stops, there's still a record of it, or a container's running in background. So typically, you can restart a container that otherwise ended. In this case, we're saying, when this thing ends, delete it. Get rid of any information that I have. I wouldn't call this like audit secure. It's just convenience. You're no longer taking up that space. Um, and anything that Nikto, for example, writes to the home directory, you might not want logs of who you've been scanning. 
So in this case, it'll just basically delete the containers that it creates, but the steps are very much the same. It finds this, so here we've referenced a user's um, version of Nikto using Alpine. Pulled it down, cache layers, things like that. In this case, we didn't have to tell it to run Nikto, but we did tell it dash host and example.com, so we've passed in the command line parameter, and then Nikto's gone and run and output everything to the screen because we didn't run in daemon mode, so this is interactive, but we will get a prompt back when it finishes. Another tool, Sublister, um, it's one that I quite like, and um, so I've made a container for it myself. It's really, really easy to do. We'll look at that just now. Same thing, it automatically will run the binary. We're just passing in the command line arguments that we need, and it will run outputs in color, and it looks very native. It's a little bit large, though, at 257 megs, but still nothing compared to running like a Vagrant Ubuntu or Kali Linux having to boot up or run in a VM just to use one. You can get really, really interesting with it. So if you're doing CTFs or reverse engineering of hardware, you might come across some strange CPU architectures, MIPS, not necessarily strange, but very hard to work with if you don't have the right tooling in place. And um, for one of the, I think it was MWR's HackFu, there was a MIPS binary that I needed to decompile. QMU is a great emulator for running stuff, but it's quite a big beast to install. It's a bit of a pain. Sometimes stuff doesn't work. To run the binary, you need like a, a MIPS version of Debian, and cross-compiling stuff is also just a real nightmare. So what I was able to do is just package everything straight into Docker. So I've done a lot of hard work. All you have to do is you just need to pull down my Debian MIPSL image that I've created. Here we're running, again, interactive sudo terminal because we need to log in. This starts up like an actual Debian Linux environment. So we're mounting in our current directory into forward slash host share into the Docker container. That will start up by default. It starts up with a login script or a login prompt. So you see that over there. You log in as root root, and you end up root at Debian Mipsel. That's not QMU yet. Um, but then you can make the host directory share, and you can mount it in, and then you can literally, so you're in Mipsel, you mounted the share in, and now you can run things like file, can't run this. So here we have a 32-bit Mips binary that we could run inside Docker via QMU. Again, this is all command line, so you could actually pipe stuff into it, out of it, and you're not sort of fighting with horrible pop-up windows that are non-interactive and stuff like this. This is all in your terminal or on SSH or something like that. Um, I put a similar one where I pre-bundled a whole bunch of tools, GDB, S-Trace. So you're up and running just at the cost of sort of 750 megs to a gig of download and one command line and a few steps of a readme. You're not fighting with dependencies and kernel versions and things like that. So the nice thing about Docker is once you've figured out what you need to do, you're able to kind of script that, bundle that, and then reproduce that, so it makes life a whole lot easier. Another very nice thing I came across along the similar line is something called .cross for cross-compilation. They've got a great Git repo. I think I've got the link just now. What you do is you run their .cross forward slash, in this case, Linux v 7 image. And you output it. Remember I said you've got a lot of command line interaction. You output that to a script, and it's going to pull down their image because we don't already have it. But what happens is it outputs the script. That script, when run, runs their Docker container, and you can give it commands. So what I'm able to do is I have a hello.c file locally on my Mac. I've generated their script using their container. It's going to end up calling their container. And what I'm doing is I'm using the um, C++ or the C compiler to compile that file, outputting to hello arm, inside their Linux arm container. So I know that's a bit confusing, but for two lines of code, my output is not what it should be. Okay, so I run that command. Now, we're not in the terminal here where I'm running file. This is back in the host Mac terminal, but I've produced an ARM executable file, and where it's really, really useful if you're writing exploits and compiling things for legitimate purposes, of course. These are all of the images that they have and the outputs that they support, so you're not fighting with... I guess that's like 16 VMs. You're not fighting with different dependencies, command um, compilation arguments and things like that. Just by using a different image name to create these scripts, telling the script how you want to compile a file, you can produce binaries for nearly every platform. So that's really, really useful. 900 megs, but zero effort. You're literally running two commands and you're compiling for ARM. A lot better than getting Android Studio up and running. So. Let's look at something a little more hackery again and some more command line options. So we're going to run Metasploit, and we're going to link some containers and pass in some environment variables. So we're extending our use of Docker a little bit more. 
In this case, we want a Postgres database for Metasploit to write its settings and cache payloads and things too. So I did have to find containers that would work together. Um, there's possibly an easier way, but I just wanted to illustrate the principle. So what I'm doing here is I'm running in daemon mode uh, Postgres, which you can see on the far right, and I've just named it MSF for Metasploit Postgres. I've set an environment variable with minus E, setting the Postgres user to MSF. This in itself doesn't do anything magic, but the way this Postgres image is created, it looks for environment variables and overrides its default config, such as the username. So in this case, by setting the username to Metasploit, the default password is what Metasploit would try by default, so they'll be able to just connect just by changing the username, and um, I don't think I need that minus T there, but we're running Postgres, so that's gonna be 287 megs. It's gonna run in background. Then what I'm able to do is I'm able to, able to run, again, in an interactive pseudo terminal, linking in the, Metis, the MSF Postgres, so that's just a name, so Docker knows what I'm referencing. When you run a container, it's gonna generate a hash. I don't wanna copy and paste hashes. I'm able to just use a name that I declare in the first line. I'm able to reuse in the second line. But when it's mapped into Metasploit, it's just going to be called Postgres. So it's mapping sort of a friendly name for me to a, a local name. And then I'm going to forward port 8080 to 8080 of Metasploit. And I'm mapping my home folder in because I want, when Metasploit outputs data from the roots Metasploit inside the Docker, I actually want it to come out into my host machine so I can reuse any output, logs, hashes, things like that that I might have come across. And in this case, I'm using some guy called M. Douglas's Metasploit container, which is able to connect to the Postgres one. So we're in for, call it 300 and 700 megs. So for one gig, you've got Metasploit up and running. You haven't fought with installing Ruby, gems, native compilation, or anything like that. You've still got the output to your home directory. You've got a reusable Postgres, so everything's gonna be cached. You're not scanning every time and building up databases and libraries. Um, and you'll be able to update this. You've got Docker running, uh, sorry, you've got Metasploit running in Docker really, really easily. So again, we just, the principle here is you're able to link in one container to another so they can almost sort of network and know about each other and um, environment variables. But what about Kali? We've looked at a few tools. Everyone knows that Kali is the operating system of choice. What about running Kali inside Docker? I said earlier that Docker is normally a single application and its dependencies. Kali is a whole distro of Linux. It's quite common for there to be images like Ubuntu or Debian. They come with tools like apt. You get etc folders, bin folders. So they sort of break away from the rule a little bit. They're sort of this whole operating system platform. And the Kali guys have done the exact same thing. There are official images that you can get from their website. It's up on Docker Hub, and you can just pull it down. Just Docker run, interactive pseudo terminal, Kali Linux Docker, and the command that you want, bin bash. That'll drop you into a Kali shell. There is a problem, though. They're not shipping the live DVD that you might run or install. It's not sort of eight gigs of of Kali Linux with all the tools installed, it's just the bare bones. So you've got apt, the repositories are there, the tools are there, the folder parts are the same. So it's everything you're used to, you just have to install the tools yourself. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to Docker run Kali, pull it down to your machine and rush off to an engagement where you have no internet access. You won't be able to use that image as it is, but by all means, set it up, configure it, you're able to save the changes that you've made, make it your own, pull down what you want, use your own version of it but rather than just making manual changes, we can actually script those changes. So the way Docker images are traditionally built is with something called a Docker file. This is like a build recipe for them, and there's several lines that go into it. So we're gonna make a custom version of Kali Linux for our use. In the Docker file, we specify where we want to start, what we wanna build from. In this case, we're using their official image. It's got everything that we want in order to install our packages. Now, there's quite a few options for that first line of a Docker file. They've got something called Scratch that you can reference, which is literally empty. It's like null, it's a void, zero megabytes, nothing. That's great if you have a binary that you want to run on its own. An example might be something like BusyBox. It might be something that your company's produced. You don't need a whole Linux subsystem, perhaps, to run your single standalone binary. So you can just map your binary in, and there's no underlining layer at all. So your Docker size should be almost the same as your actual binary that you've pushed in. I mentioned BusyBox. That's a valid layer that you can pull down if you need some um, command line tools. 1.13 megs, so that's really handy to build on top of if you need to do a few things, piping, tailing, gripping, things like that. Ubuntu is very popular, but it comes in 122 megs. It's also very bare bones. You've got the CLI tools, you've got apt, but it really doesn't do much, and you're gonna start pulling in a whole lot of packages and dependencies as soon as you start building on top of it. And then you have Alpine Linux. Um, by comparison, it's only four megs. It is 
almost like the open WRT of Linux for desktop computers. I'm not necessarily saying you should use it as a desktop OS, but it's amazing for Docker. A lot of the official images have now started switching over to Alpine. The images are a lot smaller for all of the same functionality. There's a packet manager, you can get all your libraries, you can compile stuff. So if you're not sure which container to use, uh, which base layer to use, I would definitely suggest giving Alpine a try. It's got APK instead of apt, but all the same functionality. Um, again, layers are shared. So if you're already building a whole lot of stuff of Ubuntu, it should be fine. But if you're putting something out in the public domain, if everyone else is using Alpine, do you want to be the guy that forces your user to download 122 megs that he doesn't have because you're the only guy using Ubuntu instead of Alpine? So please consider using Alpine. Back to building our custom Kali Linux Docker, though. We specified where we want to start. This will give us our base layer to build on top of. Maintainer pretty much just lets people know who made it and how to get hold of you. Then you're able to issue commands that it must run. So as Docker's doing this, it's much like a batch file or a bash script. We're going to update apt. We're going to do a dist upgrade before we do anything. So we're going to make sure our Kali Linux rolling is as up-to-date as it can be. And then in this case, we're going to install the Metasploit framework, nmap, and the word list for password cracking. So we just can get a few basic tools in there. And when you run it, drop us into bash so that we can choose which to make use of that Docker file, you just say Docker build, and you point to the directory the file is in. So in this case, it's pulling an image. As I said, images will be reused if it's already present. You can see that the step two of five is using a cache. So if you make changes to this Docker file at the end, let's say you add a new line at the bottom of the Docker file, it doesn't always have to do the whole process again. You can save a lot of time. Um, you can do a lot of sort of upgrading, reusing of scripts without pulling down new packages and layers if you do things correctly. Not going to get into it now, but it's worth knowing that layers are cached and there's various ways you can do to cache or not cache things. Um, we've got a local Kali Linux repo, if you didn't know. So that's really, really awesome. Once our Docker container finishes, um, you can see the commands that it's running as it goes through the various steps. Right at the end, we read step five out of five, and it says successfully built F5 EED. There are ways to tag it at the time of compiling, but we're going to just tag it afterwards. So... We take the hash that was produced, that's an image, we tag it under mykali is the name for it, and we can then run mykali. So we can list it, those are the images I pulled down. So we've ended up at three and a half, well, 3.1 gigs after doing app gets and things like that. So they, these images do inflate quite quickly. You can see the nice name on the left and slash the repository of it. And you can see the image ID, we can reference either to start it, but we're just gonna run interactively by name. We're now root at dbf, so that's the container ID. And we can then run nmap. So we've sort of built our own Kali container. That image is now snapshotted, so we can start it up whenever we want and start new instances from it. Just to mention very quickly, I said earlier there are different networking options. So you can run Docker Network LS, and it will print out stuff. Docker adds functionality, or you want to know what your host supports. Um, that should tell you the options that are available. Bridge, none, and host. So none would obviously isolate any network and TCP activity. Bridge is used by default. So your Docker containers can speak to each other, but you're going to need to expose ports if you want other people on the LAN or on the net. Then, um, Docker Network Inspect is quite useful. That'll dump a whole lot of networking information as well about a container and your current setup and things like that. But this is probably not too relevant. When you're starting a Docker container, you can dash dash net host. This is more uh, risky because it allows, it, it's using your host network inside Docker. So if someone compromises your running container, opens up a reverse shell, that host, that TC port becomes open. So if that's internet facing or network facing, that container is now internet or network facing. So use that with caution. And previously there was a bug when running in this mode, if you try to reboot or shut down the container, that message actually leaked out and the host got shut down as well. So um, there's some magic privileged sort of connectivity happening there. Don't use it unless you know what it is and you really want. So that's quite cool. But what about GUI applications? Something like Verb Suite. What if we want to intercept traffic with Docker? Surely that's not doable. We've spoken about command lines so much. Well, we've got a few things we can do. X11 VNC, which is a VNC server and provides a fake X11 display. We could use Firefox for browsing and setting a proxy, such as Verb Suite. Verb Suite's the app that we want to run. And there's something cool called NoVNC, which is an HTML5 VNC client. You can bundle this all together and create a container which actually listens on a web port, provides a web VNC that connects to a VNC server, 
that then has X11 and runs Firefox and Burp Suite. Or you can just go and pull this container down that does everything for you. And you connect to your local host on port 80. It starts, you see a window manager, Linux environment. And here I've got Firefox open in the background, Burp, C, Burp Suite in front. This is all happening inside Docker. There's no evidence of this on my machine. When I'm done, I can delete this file and all of that goes away. I haven't had to install Burp Suite, Java, things like that, all contained. And I haven't given access to my actual host display or anything crazy like that. So that's really useful. So that's just a really quick fly through of using Docker, the things that you can do, command line GUI, building images. Um, but we need to talk about attacking Docker because this is a hacker conference. This might not be too relevant, but I did find this information really interesting. If you get a Docker container or you run a Docker image container, you don't necessarily have shell access or root access. So if we take that Nikto image that we ran earlier, and we tell it we want to run shell rather than pass in command line options, we get an error, we see Nikto started, and it's given us an error that no host was specified. But we didn't want to run Nikto, we wanted to run shell. The reason for that, in this case we've got a Docker file we can look at, is that along with the from line and the maintainer, they've specified an entry point. So that's what happens when this container starts. It's gonna run this entry point, and the command by default will be minus H, printing Nikto's help. What we've done is we've only overwritten the minus H. So our SH got passed to the entry point. A bit confusing and um, people have sort of debated which should come first, but it's just worth knowing that you've kind of got two layers of execution, the entry point and the command. Luckily, all that we need to do is we're able to specify a different entry point in this case, changing it to SH rather than putting the SH at the end. And in this case, we get dropped to the command line. So we've got bash inside that container. But if we do a who am I, we're a user, we're not root. In the previous case, we saw that we were root. Um, this is just another line inside that Docker file when it's built, it says, you know, the user for this container is user. But there's just one other command line option. We can just say, hey, Docker, I wanna be root. So if you're building containers and you think that this has done anything to secure the code that you're shipping, it hasn't. It's just a convenience that the user starts up in a certain user mode they can run whatever command they want and they can be root in your container. So don't think containers are locked or secure or anything like that. What about finding sensitive data inside a container? We've spoken about these images that are available on Docker Hub. Um, companies might have them running on devs machines, on servers, private repositories, things like that. So let's run a container that I created specifically for this demo. So it is a bit of a silly example. But we're running, again, Interactive Terminal, the container that I've created with Bash, and we're just telling it to list the files and cat key.pub. Public key, right? What could possibly go wrong? Nothing. It's a public key. But let's take a little bit of a deeper look at this container. You can ask Docker to tell us the history of it. Now, there's this really interesting layer over there at the eight-minute mark. So this is sort of how it started up. This is BusyBox. There's a 906-byte layer and then a 300-byte layer. It seems like more layers than we would need if I've just pushed in one file. We can ask Docker not to run it by name, but to run that image layer and do the same thing, cat the public key. Suddenly it's a private key. So if you do something wrong when you're building your container or if your environment is perhaps building a production container and then afterwards you're sort of slipping in dev credentials and pushing it to your dev server, if someone compromises it, they can still go and access those files and those config files that you think you've overwritten and committed in dev mode, your prod creds could very possibly still be there. Something else that you can do, which is kind of fun, is you can tell Docker to save a container name. That's going to output it out of the Docker ecosystem to a file on your computer, or in this case, to a pipe. And I'm just running it through strings, and because private keys are strings, the strings command does a really good job of finding this. So this is kind of flattening all those layers, but it still hasn't erased that image. Even though I've overwritten it, fixing the private key with the public key, they exist almost as different parts. Um, so the file system doesn't see this file anymore, but the data is still there in those Docker images. But that's a string, so that's quite easy to find. What if there's more interesting stuff? What about undeleting files? This isn't even necessarily a hard drive image. These are layers of changes in files. Well, you can do Docker save again. This time we're going to output it to a binary file. Test disk and photo rec are great undelete tools for all platforms. They find tons of different file types. So I extract that image. I'm not even aware of what the file system looks like or how many layers. I'm just snapshotting the whole thing to a local file that I can use. I'm running an undeleter on it. And it finds nine files from BusyBox. And if I happen to find the right file, 
you can see it's dug out the private key. So there could be binary files, image files, all kinds of things inside your Docker images. They're not safe. Even if they're deleted, even if they're not referenced, people can still do undeletes on produced containers, even if it's not the latest image that has that stuff. So if you've done stuff ages ago, if you've built off um, images someone else has created, you don't know what's lying under the file system that you can't even see. Let's imagine now that we're a malicious dev at a company or we get access at a company or someone's machine. What about backdooring images? We said before that people reuse things like Ubuntu. So what we're able to do, this is gonna be a bit complex, but just bear with me. We're able to inspect an image such as Ubuntu. We're looking for the entry point or the command. As I mentioned, that's the sort of two commands that could happen when the containers run. So we want to see what a target image does when it starts up, what the default behavior is. It's useful to copy that command. Then we can run the image and this time run bash instead. So this assumes you do have access to the image. So you've either got the person's Docker Hub credentials or you're on the network or something like that. In this case, I've been using Ubuntu. I'm going to do an app get update and I'm going to install SoCat, which is a great reverse shell tool. I exit out of it do Docker PS to see the name of that container that I've just created that has um, SoCat installed. I'm going to commit it to temp name just for my sake so I've got a reference to it. So I've now got the target application plus SoCat, uh, SoCat as a separate container. Now, I run the container that I've created and saved, and I pass in the old command. And then I run my reverse shell. And what we do then is we look at the hash, that running command, and we commit that back over Ubuntu. When you do a Docker commit, it saves that image under a new name. So in this case, all the stuff that we've been doing turns into Ubuntu. But the reason we've done the, the second and third step separately is because in step two, we ran shell. And in step three, we ran the old command on our SoCat. This command is what will be saved as the image's entry point or the command. So now when someone runs Ubuntu, it's actually running this previous line, which is going to be everything it always used to do, but start up a reverse shell. So if this is a container that someone's using in a workplace, it may very well function as they expected, but do something really, really nasty when they start it up. And as I say, if this is pushed to Docker Hub and someone pulls it down, potentially bad things happen. But there's an easier way of doing this. There's a tool called Docker Scan, which will find various vulnerabilities and let you um, various analysis on containers but it also has the option to backdoor them for you. So here we're going to save Ubuntu again. We're extracting it from the Docker sort of file management and all the rest. We're flattening it to a single file on our machine. We're able to tell Docker scan to process the image, modify it, trojanize it. We point to the file that we want to trojan. Um, although that's a minus L, we're actually setting where the reverse shell should go to. This does its thing. Um, and it produces temp.tar, and it tells us the command that we need to run to listen, to receive that reverse shell. We then tell Docker to load this tar file in. So this is Docker's way of importing and exporting. Docker says, oh no, Ubuntu already exists. I'll just rename the old one to an empty string and bring your one in as Ubuntu latest. Again, we can't push this up to Docker Hub and replace their Ubuntu latest. But within someone's local machine or local environment, we're able to change what happens when they reference Ubuntu. In this case, we've got a backdoored image. Let's think about attacking users. Developers have a whole lot of access these days. They're possibly better targets than prod servers that might be locked down. We're going to use cross-site request forgery on a user. When Docker runs, the daemon can listen on a TCP port. By default, it's a Unix, Unix socket. So there's a few things that, that might happen here. There's a few cases where it might not be running on a Unix socket, but a TCP socket. But let's just pretend it's running on 127.0.0.1.2375. If I visit a page that has, so I, I visit a website, your website, someone else's website, and there's malicious code on it, that's going to do a form post to my local host, which is to the Docker daemon. It could tell the Docker daemon to do a build, and we're able to specify a remote Docker file. So this is a script on pastebin. I mentioned the network mode host being quite dangerous, so we're going to put that in there. We want that in. Oh, and I get to choose where that container that gets built gets called. So I can overwrite the local machine's Ubuntu image. Now, normally, your browser would complain about this because there's cross-origin resource sharing and things like that that needs to happen. But there's no payload for this post. So none of those checks happen. This just goes straight through, and Docker just accepts get parameters on a post request. Of course, we can slip in some JavaScript to make the form submit. So this can all be happening in the background. You browse a website. You've got Docker listening on localhost. And the next thing you know, your Ubuntu image isn't what you thought it was. 
Here you can see I've got a four meg Ubuntu image created just now. That's not the real image. That's the malicious one. And if we just ran it with um, that post happening outside of an iframe or anything, this is the output that you would see. It's very much like what Docker does. You can see that's pulling from Alpine. Uh, you can see I've echoed test to hello.txt, and it ends up building and tagging that on my machine as Ubuntu. So now you're potentially taking over Docker from outside the network just by getting people to click on a malicious link, which I think is quite cool. What about typo squatting? Phishing Docker Hub. So you can register any name on Docker Hub that's not already registered. Well, we used Kali Linux just now, so let's change the L to a 1. You can upload any image, backdoored or not, under any name you want. We're able to reuse Kali Linux Docker in the same way that we could reuse Ubuntu. It'll just be namespaced with our username. So you can just copy and paste their real profile and image and the details for the image in the web interface and just make your own. I mean, that looks very much like theirs. I mean, maybe the user won't notice the one instead of an L. You can't use Unicode, unfortunately, so you need to be a little creative about your naming, but here we have a pretty legit looking version of Kali, if any of you would like to uh, install it. We can remove the image locally, where we built it, and we can pull it down from Docker Hub using the full paths, in this case, Kali one Linux or slash Kali Linux Docker. And we can just loop that, and we can create Docker Hub accounts and start that repository. So if someone searches for Kali or Kali Linux, yeah, you get the official one there at the top out of 160,000 results, but look what I had on Docker Hub yesterday. So um, you probably don't want to install that container. I mean, I didn't quite reach a million pulls or 360 stars, but it's totally conceivable that you could do that and take the number one position. What about attacking Docker networks? So let's say you get reverse shell on a box and it's running Docker. How do you know if you're inside a Docker container? Well, there's a few things you can do. Um, I don't fully understand all of them, but we're just going to run through some steps. Slides will be available if you want to play around with this. Quite often there's a Docker env file. There's a bit of a giveaway, so you can check to see if that file's present on the machine. You can also check various proc settings. So in this case, if proc process one C group contains Docker, guess what? You're inside Docker. You can take a look at the proc one schedule, I think it is. It's normally in it, um, or PID1, and it shows some other stuff if you're inside Docker. Docker assigns host names to machines, so it could, if you see 12 hexadecimal characters, it could be a Docker-generated host name. Um, looting and pivoting. So when you link containers like we did with Postgres, Docker populates them in the etc host file for you. So if you've got access to one machine and you want to go looking for other machines, start with a host file. It'll tell you where to go and look for other things, and it'll probably name them. So, oh, look, there's Postgres server running on 172.17.02, and it was tagged with MSF Postgres. Okay, that's used for Metasploit. The way sharing works, I mentioned we're able to override the username, which you can see in that second last line so that my uh, Metasploit's able to find it. It pushes all of these into the linked containers. So suddenly all these containers have all these environment variables with all these other containers, usernames, potentially passwords, major minor ver versions, ports, things like that. So within a Docker image, export can be your friend and just dump tons of creds for zero effort. Obvious things, they'll likely share an IP range, so if you in a machine, get us IP, and map the range, you'll likely find a lot of other machines. What about running Docker inside Docker? I mentioned there's a client in the server. We're not trying to get Docker server running inside Docker server inside Docker server, but the client runs nearly anywhere, including inside Docker. Some tools, like Docker SSH and some Jenkins builds, would have you mount the Docker socket. Remember I said it listens on a Unix socket, not necessarily a port. Some would have you mount that socket into the container itself. So if you get access to run code on that machine, the container has access to call out to the host and run other containers. So what if we decided to run BusyBox and we mounted in the etc directory of the host inside this BusyBox and then we just catted the shadow file. Docker runs as root, so the output of this command is the host's etc shadow file in the command line of the box that you've compromised. You might want to backdoor them and uh, run an image Again, this runs on the host machine outside of the container you've compromised. That can be any image. You can push an image to the Docker Hub. You can pull it down from the Docker Hub. You don't even have to worry about taking over and backdooring their existing images if you can pull down something somewhere else. You might want to look at their logs. Maybe they're running some really super secret software and you can't get it running locally and you don't want to pull it out the system. You can just dump the logs from it. You could attach to it, kill processes. Um, so, yes, doing this, mapping your Docker socket into a container, 
literally exposes the host machine and all the other containers to huge risk. I would not recommend that. Running Docker in production um, is not something that people do very easily, so I'm not going to explain it. I'm just going to mention these. Service discovery is hard, especially with microservices. How does one container know where another one is if it's not this file? What if you're trying to run, like, sharding and load balancing and things like that? How does everything know where to find stuff? People don't have such a great solution. Um, you can't rely on the IP addresses. Docker's going to reassign IP addresses. So people set up subdomains pointing to proxies. So look for them. Enumerate them. Look for hard-coded and shared credentials, like we said with those ENV bars. Look for the source code you find. You'll find a whole lot of stuff within a D uh, Docker ecosystem. And then networking and firewalling is really, really hard, especially when you've got a network or a host that has its IP. It's then got perhaps a load balancer's network range, and then the machines have their own network range, and things are bridging, and things are hosting. So what do people do? They just open everything. Oh, I just share the ports. You know, I, I don't know which network it must be open for. Let's just open it to the internet. You know, so definitely scan ports because everything's just going to be connected to everything else in a really, really, really bad way. Um, attacking the stacks themselves, very popular is Kubernetes. There's a great tool called Minikube, which will get you up and running locally for minimal amount of work. Uh, this is a very great blog that takes you through it. Um, I would definitely recommend looking at Kubernetes, how people are using it, deploying it, and misusing it. Um, because, yeah, that's going to be one of the really popular ones. There's a bunch of other stuff, but I think we're quite short on time, so I'm just going to skip over it. A uh, great way to do static analysis of Docker images. Docker have got tags that will, they've started now rating whether images have vulnerabilities or not. Really, really great if you know someone's using an image. Go here, see if that image has vulnerabilities, then go attack them, or don't attack them. Um, using, latest tags is, uh, using latest tags is generally bad practice, and you can run Docker not as root, so definitely go check that out if you're going to run Docker. And then the NIST have actually put together a container security guide, which is quite useful, so that's a bit of a cheat sheet. And you can do things like you can now mount your GPU inside Docker container for mining or password cracking, which is cool. There's a boot to root that you can do inside Docker to learn more about it. We mentioned Minikube. You can run the very first Unix from 1972, to keep with the theme, inside Docker. Uh, Docker Compose lets you build really big, complex networks very, very easily with Docker. 25% uh, of Docker images have significant vulnerabilities, says a recent study. So that's really interesting, because remember, people are building on top of these layers. So if a layer is vulnerable, anything built on top of it likely is vulnerable too. Uh, you can do access point stuff, host access points and all the rest, mapping wireless into Docker, also really, really cool. Some more security auditing stuff. And if you're interested in InfoSec, please come join us at Zero X Coffee. We're on meetup.com. We have a website. We meet monthly. Super, super casual get-together. And if you want to know more about Docker, talk to the DevOps guys. Uh, they've got a meetup, and they've got an annual conference. You should definitely get involved with that. I had a bunch of stickers printed, and they really, really messed them up. So you're welcome to get some stickers, but you'll have to cut them out yourself. I do have another delivery arriving, which will probably be at the next Zero X Coffee. And that's a wrap. Thank you, guys. Um, we're quite short on time, but are there any questions? Otherwise, chat to me afterwards, I think, might be better. Um, I'll do my best. Cool. Thank you, guys.